Hello, programmers. A big, giant welcome to the wonderful world of Java loops. This discussion covers the basic while loop that has its test for looping at the top and the do while loop with a test at the bottom of the loop. The for loop with its two varieties is also covered. Let's get started with the while loop. The while loop starts off with the word while, followed by a Boolean expression inside a set of parentheses that must evaluate to true or false. As long as the expression evaluates true, the body of the loop is executed. In this example, the variable i is initialized to 1. The while loop will execute the body of the loop as long as i is less than or equal to 6. The body of the loop has two statements. A print line outputs the value of i. The second statement increments i so that i starts at 1 and increments all the way to 7. When i is a 7, the Boolean expression for the while becomes a false and the body of the loop is no longer executed. Here are the flowcharts for the while and do while loops. So far, the results for either loop are the same. They each display the numbers 0 through 4. When the loop ends, a print line statement shows done. The test condition for the while loop is at the top of the loop, but the test condition for the do while loop is at the bottom of the loop. As we will see, there will be times when this can make a big difference. One more thing to look at in these examples is that i starts at 0 and the loop continues as long as i is less than 5. There are five passes through the loop starting at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It is very common in programming to start counting from 0. If you're new to programming, this is something to get used to. It is most common to start counting from 0 because the first index or position in an array starts with 0. This may be confusing for most Americans who count the ground floor of a building as the first floor, but the rest of the world, the first floor is the one that is above the ground floor. Here is a program fragment. It is only a piece of a full program. It is missing all the extra things that are needed to make a program run. If you wanted to run this program fragment, you would need to add any needed import statements, the class statements, the void main statement, and any of their open and close curly braces. Also needed are the statements to create the scanner object named STDIN, or standard in. This fragment inputs three numbers, one at a time, from the user and adds them to the variable total. After all three numbers have been processed, the total is displayed with the print line statement. Writing a program this way is okay as long as there are not too many numbers to add up. Just think of all the code that would need to be written to input and add 20 numbers or even 100. Another problem with coding this way is that the number of inputs may change, causing a major rewrite of the program. Now we have the same result that uses a loop. A new variable, i, has been included, which is used to control the loop. The loop control counts from 0 to less than 3, which causes the program to loop 3 times, 0, 1, 2. When i becomes a 3, the loop ends without executing the body of the loop. This time, the prompt, input from the keyboard, and add into the total are only needed one time. If it is ever necessary to add a different number of inputs instead of 3, the only thing that needs changing is the number 3. In these examples, the value in i is initialized to 10. The Boolean expression for the loop control is testing for a value of less than 5, which is going to be false because 10 is not less than 5. Since the test is done at the top of the while loop, the body of the loop is never executed. The print line statement at the end of the loop is executed, which displays done on the output terminal. The do while loop always executes the code in the body at least one time because the loop test is at the bottom. In this case, the print line statement in the body displays a 10. The test at the bottom fails, and we don't execute the body of the loop a second time. The print line statement after the loop displays done. 
This program fragment is similar to the ones already discussed. This time, five integers are going to be read from the keyboard and added to a total. When the loop ends, the total is displayed. Let's look closely at this program. It is very important to not put a semicolon character after the closing parentheses of the test condition or even after the open curly brace. The body of the loop is executed five times. When i becomes a 5, we fall out of the loop and print the total. Just for the discussion, suppose that the user entered the following numbers 12, 23, 9, negative 6, 37. If these numbers were entered, the total would end up being 75. Let's look closely to see what happens as the program progresses. The initial state of the total is 0 and i is a 0. Since 0 is less than 5, the body of the loop is executed. For example, a 12 is read from the keyboard and added to the total, which becomes 12. Then i is incremented using i++, causing i to become a 1. When starting the second pass, i is now a 1, which is less than 5. Therefore, the body of the loop is executed. This time, suppose we read a 23 from the keyboard, so the total becomes 35. The last thing that happens is that i is incremented and becomes a 2. Third time's a charm. i is a 2, which is less than 5, so we do the body of the loop again. The print routine asks the user to enter a number. The next int method reads an integer from the keyboard, which for our discussion is a 9. The 9 is added to the total, which becomes 44. i is incremented using i++ and it becomes a 3. On the fourth pass through the loop, i starts out at 3. Remember, we are counting from 0. Since 3 is less than 5, we execute the body of the loop again. This time the user inputs a negative 6. We are not rejecting negative numbers, so the negative 6 gets added to our total, which changes from 44 to 38. i is incremented to a 4. i starts out at 4, which is still less than 5. In the body of the loop, we ask for and read the next number. In our example, the value read is 37. It is added to the current value in the total of 38. The new value in the total is 75 i is incremented to be a 5. This time i is a 5 at the start of the loop. We only do the body of the loop if i is less than 5, which it is not, so we exit the loop with i still equal to a 5 and the total is 75. We fall out of the loop. The print line statement displays the total is 75. In summary, we went through the loop five times with i going from 0 through 4. Once we reached 5, the loop ended. The do while loop has the test condition at the bottom of the loop. This structure is very common when the decision is not known in advance as to the number of times to go through the loop. The coin flip game has a question at the bottom of the loop. Do you want to play again? Y slash n. We could play the game one time or a hundred times, anything in between or even more. Watch out for this game. The way it is written, it cheats. The game simulates flipping a coin. If the coin comes up heads, the computer claims it wins. If the coin comes up tails, it claims the player loses. Then it asks if the user wants to play again. The Boolean variable play again is set true if the user presses enter or responds with anything that starts with the Y. The while part of the do while loop returns control back to the start of the loop if play again is true. Line up the curly braces for the do and the while. Everything within this block of code is considered the body of the do while loop. It will be executed at least one time and more times when the test condition of the while is true. The program creates a Boolean variable named play again. This will be used at the bottom of the program within the while statement to determine whether the loop that contains the game should be executed again. Since this is a do while loop, the game will be played at least once when the program starts. Another Boolean variable called coin is created. 
Remember that a Boolean variable can only hold a value of true or false. The result of the comparison expression greater than or equal gives a Boolean true or false. The first part of the greater than or equal is a call to math.random method, which in Java returns a value from 0.0, .0 to just less than 1.0. By comparing the result math.random greater than or equal to 0.5 semicolon, we can let half the numbers from 0.5 up to 1.0 result in true, while anything below 0.5 results in false. So half the time the coin value is true and half the time the coin value is false. I will be using true to represent heads and false to represent tails. When coin is true, the program claims it won because it always wins with heads. The else condition happens when the coin is false, indicating tails. When this happens, the program says that you lose when the coin is tails. This game really cheats. You just can't win. Rather than the cheating game, what I really want to look at, though, is how the do-while loop can be used to determine whether or not to play the game again. The while part of the do-while needs to test a Boolean expression for true or false. When true, the loop is executed again from the top of the loop. We need to set up the play again variable so that it can be tested by the while statement. The program asks the user, do you want to play again, y slash n, and then reads the keyboard into a string variable named response. See how the string variable named response is created just where it is needed instead of the top of the program with the other variables? Not only is the string variable response created at this point, but it is also assigned everything that was typed on the keyboard. The next line method returns a string containing all of the characters that were typed at the keyboard. Even more impressive, the dot to uppercase method is called to convert everything typed into uppercase capital letters before being assigned into the string variable response. I wanted to convert what was typed to uppercase so that it will not matter if the user types big or small letters. Now, look at what is placed into the Boolean play again variable. Play again equals response.length equal equals zero or response.char at zero equal equal character y. I wanted to be very user friendly and accept user inputs such as y or small y or big yes or small yes, or yup, or yada yada, or even pressing the enter key with nothing else. Any of these will cause the program to loop and play the game again. I am going to place some additional parentheses in this expression just to make it easier to read and understand. Although the parentheses are not necessary because of the order in which the expression is evaluated, sometimes it would be nice to have them there to make the program easier to understand for the next person who looks at it. Play again equals open parentheses. Open parentheses response dot length equal equals zero close parentheses. Or open parentheses response dot character at zero equal equal y close parentheses, close parentheses, semicolon. If somebody just pressed the enter key without any other characters, then the length would be zero. I will be nice and let the enter key being pressed to loop back and play the game again. The two vertical bars of the logical OR operator in Java, C, C++, etc. I am going to let either just the enter key or anything typed that starts with the letter Y cause the game to be played again. Remember that response is the string variable that receives the characters from the keyboard. So response dot character at zero gives us only the first character, position zero. The for loop is just a fancy version of a while loop. Anything that you can do with a for loop, you can do just as well with a while loop.
The for loop makes it easy to code parts of a program that are used to count things. Here is a comparison between the for loop and the while loop when used to go through the loop a specified number of times. The variable i is declared as an integer. i is initialized to 1 before the loop even starts. The first thing that happens in the loop is the test to see if the body of the loop is to be executed. If the test evaluates to true, the body is executed. The last thing inside the loop is the increment i++. The initialization happens only one time and occurs before the loop even starts. The increment happens at the bottom of the loop, even though it shows up on the same line as the for statement. The increment always happens after the main body of the loop is executed. If there's only one statement for the body of the loop, the curly braces can be eliminated. Watch out for the placement of the semicolons in the for statement. A semicolon is needed after the initialization statement and after the test statement, but not after the increment or after the closing parentheses. Since C, C++, and Java are fairly free form when it comes to writing code, and a statement ends with a semicolon or closed curly brace, everything could be placed on the same line if there's only one statement for the body of the loop. Even the declaration of the variable i can be placed within the for statement. This code declares a variable within the initialization expression. The variable i only exists within the for loop and is gone as soon as the loop ends. If i is not needed outside of the loop, it is best to declare the variable in the initialization expression. The names i, j, and k are often used to control for loops. Declaring them within the initialization expression limits the lifespan and reduces errors. Watch out! Do not put a semicolon at the end of the line with the for statement. If you put a semicolon at the end of the line with the for statement, you have accidentally created an empty statement that becomes the body of the loop. It will be executed as many times as programmed in the for statement, and then control moves on to the next statement, which is only executed one time, not the number of times you may have wanted, thinking it was the body of the for loop. This one is even more dangerous with an unexpected semicolon after the while statement. Although it appears that there is a block of code that looks like it is the body of the while statement, the actual body of the while statement is the empty statement accidentally created by the semicolon. The while statement will continue to be executed as long as i is less than 10. The i++ is not part of the body of the loop. i never gets incremented and never changes from being a 1. The while statement will execute the dummy empty statement ending with a semicolon forever or until the program is killed. The entire AT&T long distance network went down one day because of a problem similar to this. It took several hours to correct. Another carrier named Sprint was telling everyone to switch to Sprint because they were still up and running. They crashed a few months later with egg on their faces too. Java has an enhanced version of the for loop that is not available in C or C++. Sometimes it is referred to as for each. This enhanced version is good for indexing through an array or collection, one element at a time until all elements are processed. The enhanced for statement can make loops much more compact and easier to read when working with arrays or collections. Here is an example of the enhanced for when used on an array of integers that contain the numbers 1 through 10. Actually, the name of the array is numbers. The for loop automatically steps through the array and places each value one at a time into the variable named item. Item is declared as part of the for statement. The break and continue statements can modify the order of how instructions are executed from within the body of the loop. The break and continue statements have two forms in Java, unlabeled and labeled. Only the unlabeled break and continue statements are covered here. 
refer to the Java documentation on https colon slash slash docs.oracle.com slash java se slash tutorials slash java slash nuts and bolts slash branch dot html for discussion on the labeled version of break and continue. The break statement can be used in the switch for while or do while statements. In the example below, the break statement causes execution of the program to terminate the for block of code. This program searches for the number 12 in an array. The break statement shown in boldface terminates the for loop when that value is found. Control flow then transfers to the statement after the for loop. The program output is found 12 at index 4. The continue statement skips the current iteration of a for, while, or do while loop. The unlabeled form skips to the end of the innermost loop's body and evaluates the Boolean expression that controls the loop. The following program, continue demo, steps through a string counting the occurrences of the letter P. If the current character is not a P, the continuous statement skips the rest of the loop and proceeds to the next character. If it is a P, the program increments the letter count. Here is the output of the program. Found nine P's in the string. To see this effect more clearly, try removing the continuous statement and recompiling. When you run the program again, the count will be wrong, saying that it found 35 P's and of nine. I hope you find this discussion of Java loops informative and useful. I realize that there's a lot of information covered here, especially if this is your first time looking at loops. If you feel slightly overwhelmed, look it over again the next day. Write some code that uses loops and maybe look over the discussion one more time. So, as Roy Rogers and Dell Evans would sing, Happy Trails to you until we meet again. Bye-bye. <laughs>